Lucerne, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was originally oral. It was, comes from an oral tradition. And so that's why I'm going to share it orally with you, because uh, even though it can be read silently, it's written on a page. Uh, originally, it was, was oral, and then later got written down. There are episodes of the story, then eventually uh, um, uh, uh, editors came together who put the episodes together into a longer story. Uh, and so I'm going to be sharing the, that, what, what's considered the standard compilation of the stories of Gilgamesh, uh, usually uh, uh, called the Epic of Gilgamesh, put together around 1500 BCE. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm mentioning here in the context of how Roger was talking about his process, because you'll be sitting there listening to it. Uh, it'll take about an hour or so, my guess is, or so, to, to share it with you uh, uh, orally out loud, read it, read it out loud. Uh, and um, uh, you'll, you'll just mainly uh, uh, be having the experience of sitting in the chairs, like Roger had mentioned, the dam, these awful fake rubber chairs, terrible. And it's, an, and it's a dreadful space. And I thought about uh, trying to dim the space, or I don't know what we did originally. We had candles when, when, when I earlier read this publicly was, was in the early 90s in the basement of an Episcopal church on Melrose. <laughs> and uh, we used mood lighting and it was, you know, so I thought about this, such, this is such an icky place, you know, and in, in, in the ancient times where the story would be shared, it would have been in a ritual way uh, and it would have been in a more respectful space. So my apologies for that it's that way and you kind of have to sit there uh, in this really a rather uncomfortable space as to be the experience of it. But uh, in my opinion, it's, it's worth it to experience it out loud, uh, uh, even though it takes a while uh, just to be able to encounter it in that form. Uh, even though, it's, like I mentioned, there are many now translations of it that are available. I don't know anyone in here who, who uh, can read ancient Sumerian or whatever, but that's available too, I suppose, if one can read that language or Babylonian or other versions, Akkadian, I think there's versions in Akkadian, which is like a sister language to Sumerian, or, or even earlier, I don't know exactly, something like that. A long time ago, when, when it was still early to write things down. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, if possible, after I read the story, uh, you know, uh, I'm hoping there might be enough time that I can begin to share with you then my commentary, kind of, uh, a affirmative Jungian commentary written in the mid 80s on this story. Uh, uh, share perhaps the first couple sections because they kind of uh, explain some of the context of the story and all that rather than my doing that now beforehand. Because uh, it's all kind of written down that way. Also, I get out of the way some, some of the uh, first sections of that paper, which will be mainly what I'll be sharing next month. In this club, I'm going to continue that. It's a long paper, it's about 62, 60. Four pages long. Uh, uh, if I share a couple sections now afterwards, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to pick up next month and finish it, uh, finish it off. Uh, the reason for tying that in is uh, uh, connected with a little bit of a story, which I'll share with you why we're doing this. Uh, I happen to notice that in Roger referred to the advanced training program that we began last August. And I have to notice that in its, uh, as a reading and writing component. And I have to notice that this old essay of mine on the Gilgamesh story was there in the readings. And so I thought, oh, that would be really interesting if I read it out loud, if I read the, this paper I'd written actually a long time ago. I, I, I don't have an exact date for it, which is why it's got that mushy quality. It was in the 80s. I think it was in the mid-80s, because on purpose I wouldn't date it wouldn't put a date on it, so I don't know exactly when I wrote it in terms of the exact year. Uh, it's somewhere in there uh, from the tone of it and the references to it and stuff like that. Uh, the Monique reference, which is I think the oldest, or latest is 87, but it could have been a very late entry uh, in my on playing with the piece and stuff, you know, fiddling with it. Or some parts of it feel even earlier in terms of where it was at in my development. I might comment on that. Uh, perhaps when we get to my own commentary, uh, it's a commentary now from a very long time ago, you see, uh, but of a piece of story that's even older. Uh, I'll be sharing with you what, what us Westerners would be able to tolerate pretty much, 
uh, or attempted, uh, attempted a narrative story. Uh, in the original, it's embedded in amazingly wonderful, actually beautiful repetitions of sections and refrains, and it's all done in poetry, first of all, which is here in the version I'll share with you, been converted into prose. Uh, so already we're shifting, and not only do we not have a, 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 um, a nurturing, a supportive space in which to share such a story, but also the story's been turned into uh, mainly the narrative. We've boiled it, it's, it's translators and how it's been handled have boiled it down from poetry into prose and into something that's fairly simplified in terms of all the repetitions and all its avert. It's a, you know, like a ritual to read it. You wouldn't just read it. Like a, a person, a special person would share it. We might call them a bard or a singer. They might have some kind of instrument. They might be accompanied by others, for example, who could sing or and or dance as well as the person performing, let's say. And what would be performance in our sense of the word, performing? Uh, singing the poem, which would be the story. And if we were going to get into the full story, uh, uh, it actually would take a, a whole series of days to actually perform, share, that is the whole full story. Uh, it's quite extensive, even in this, uh, uh, we might call it westernized, boiled down version. That's just a strict, pretty strict narrative story of who's, who's involved, and they come on stage, and they do their thing, and that's it, and we go through the different parts. Okay, uh, the other thing I might want to mention beforehand, before I get started, is that this particular version of the story, which I, the whole story of stories, all the little stories are put together. They're fragments, they're none of the fragments of the stories uh, that make up this epic poem uh, from the very beginnings of uh, written literature back in the now very crumbling libraries of these ancient writer old mounds in the Middle East and so on and so forth, southern Turkey and places like that. Uh, uh, and uh, it seems like that there were more and more complete versions put together by various scribes in the temples, who would be various forms of what we would call now priests. Uh, and uh, the most extensive version, which then became what might later on have been called the standard version, except all this culture of the Sumerians was forgotten later on, the time of Roman, Greek times, all this had been forgotten, believe it or not, by traditions which eventually became what we call Western. Uh, didn't, didn't remember any of this stuff. They didn't even have a, 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 an idea of a word like Gilgamesh, much less anything related to his tale, or actually it's a set of tales, you see. So uh, uh, there's a character uh, named Sinleki Unini, who uh, lived sometime around 1500 BCE, before the Common Era. Uh, who was uh, described, at least in the translation I've seen, as an exorcist priest. Uh, but his job in the temple uh, involved uh, uh, the priestly duty of interfacing with the spirits of the dead. Uh, and uh, exor exorcist priests would have to do, there are other classes of so-called priests, that are what we might translate better by the word shaman or shamanic than priestly or as a priest in our sense of the word priest. Uh, so um, that's why you'll notice when I tell you the story, it involves uh, uh, shamanic qualities vis-a-vis -vis the uh, duties or responsibilities put on the king. And then the reference to uh, the most common way that the shaman would work his shamanic uh, experience, which is with a drum. You have a shamanic drum of some kind, and then something to hit it with, which would be called the beater, usually carved out of wood. Uh, and uh, you'll see in the story that comes into play in the last tale of the story about uh, Gilgamesh and the Hulubu tree, uh, which, by the way, is uh, uh, technically speaking uh, considered part of its tablet 12. There are 12 tablets that tell the entire story. Uh, they don't break down exactly into exact tales for each tablet. The tablet 12 has always been a puzzle to uh, uh, archaeologists and also have dug it up and then translated and figured it out because it seems to it seems to be an, uh, appended afterwards and it's not well integrated with the earlier parts of the story. So in terms of what I'm going to share with you, I'm going to share with you a version in which uh, uh, I've attempted uh, to integrate that last tablet into the story, as a, in my opinion, Sinleki Unini was interested in doing. In 
my opinion, what happened was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, folks in his position had such respect for these written versions of things that even though they'd want to be more uh, uh, what we call an editor, he couldn't do it. He was, he was, the, he, it was uh, together enough about the whole story to bring in this part of the story, but not to fully integrate it. So uh, that's why scholars now go, huh, they can't quite figure out why is it there. So uh, in my opinion, why it's there, okay, is because uh, Sinlechi Unini wants uh, to have an origin story of why Gilgamesh is the main figure that priests, like an exorcist priest, call to as the teacher of this form of mysticism. He's like the kind of equivalent of, he's like Orpheus in the sense of, you follow this way of beauty. It's odd to describe this, but in the Sumerian context, not in the Greek context, there's no musical instruments here. Okay, so it might sound a little odd like this. But Gilgamesh, by the time of Sinleki Unini, okay, these stories of Gilgamesh have to do not merely with secular themes, okay, and a long time even earlier than 1500 BC, this was so as well, okay. They have to do with it, how the story explains how Gilgamesh became the underworld king of, of anyone who would appeal to the underworld magisterium in terms of this mystery. You want to understand the mystery better because you want the dealings with the dead. And it depends on what kind of dealings they have. You want to be from more private things about personal persons. To, to a broader and more challenging kinds of issues and concerns. You might be concerned with the, such a priestly figure in a temple. Uh, it's hard to imagine a big city, so new now to have cities. Uh, they've been around for uh, a few thousand years, but only as proto-cities, really, that have a much more complicated thing in ancient Sumerian, the Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, at that time, way before Babylon, you have to picture a time even earlier than Babylon, but still in giant city, what, what they thought of as giants, not us now, but they thought of them as giants with huge walls around them to protect, because it, it, it was fierce even back then, uh, and in the middle, a giant artificial mountain. You have to picture that, not exactly in the middle, but approximately, a giant artificial mountain, and on the mountain, it'd be flattened on the top, would be a giant temple to, to the deity of the city. Uh, and in the case of Rura, which is the city of, of Gilgamesh, uh, it was Ishtar, or Nana, uh, she might uh, have been called earlier, but more commonly known as, as Ishtar. So uh, afterwards, if we have time, I'll, I'll share the first couple of sections from my commentary on that, and that puts it further in context and begins to make it into a psychological phenomenon. And, um, like all myths, the, the storytellers are not distinguishing between what's literal and what's psychological themselves. They're in the stream of, of, of human phenomena, describe it. It's a more recent phenomena. Uh, in my experience, with folks to be more purposely aware of that, of, 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 of um, having a purposeful relationship to experience itself, rather than just taking it for granted. In the past, we would call that purposeful relationship to experience a spiritual path, or perhaps a philosophical path, or perhaps an artistic path as well. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting uh, something uh, as well that is uh, in less than a homosexual field. Uh, and it's found in psychological. It's always, always like been psychological in my but it's different to call it that now. You called something else in the past. Might have been the this notion using this idea of word psychology to refer to the, the invisible world. You see, this is actually a commonly understood notion to ancient peoples, non-Western peoples, uh, not some strange or alien at all. But they wouldn't call it psychology. You see, they call it the spirit world. They were treated as if it was so. What I'm saying is psychology. Is there psychology? Meaning psychological experience. Like, for example, the world went with God. What the 
parting of the Red Sea, and so on. And there's many billion, trillion examples of them. Take a minute yourself, I'm sure. Okay.